Public Radio. This is Odyssey. I'm Gretchen Helfrich. The idea that crime should be punished is pretty uncontroversial. Who doesn't think that a person who steals or rapes or kills ought to pay a price? Not many of us. We may well disagree about which punishments are appropriate, but punishment of some form is okay, even maybe required, right? Well, why? Something must lie behind this judgment that we all have that punishment is the right response to crime. But what is it? There are many possibilities, from deterrence of other crime to simple revenge, but are all these possibilities equally legitimate? Today on Odyssey, we're going to explore some of the different theories of punishment and the answers that the different views offer to some of these basic questions. We will be talking today with legal scholar Steve Garvey. He joins us from Ithaca, New York. From Bristol, England, we're joined by philosopher Ted Hondrick. And joining us by phone from his office in Urbana, Illinois, is legal philosopher Michael Moore. Let us begin. Michael Moore, I'd like you to begin. We're going to lay out some positions here, get some, some uh, ideas on the table. The, one of the oldest views um, goes by the name of retributivism, um, and that more or less corresponds to the view you hold. So let me ask you to lay out the basics of a retributivist position. I'd be happy to, Gretchen. It's not the positions that you had outlined in the introduction to our discussion, it's not the other big two, if you like, the rehabilitative theory or the deterrence or more generally utilitarian theory. The retributivist is the person who thinks that you punish people simply because and in proportion to their just deserts. That is, the, the degree to which they have done something culpably and done something morally wrong makes it intrinsically right that they suffer punishment. It's a theory of justice, which is not to be confused with the satisfaction of vengeful de desires by victims or even by citizens in general. It's rather like a claim of justice, quite close to it, that it's unjust, for example, to punish the innocent. The claim of retributivism is that it's just to punish the guilty. It joins what I regard as other intrinsically uh, right theories of legal institutions like the promissory theory of contracts, corrective justice theory of why we have torts, and natural right theories about property. All of them justify legal institutions by the intrinsic rightness of those kinds of sanctions being attached to certain behaviors, and retributivism is one of those. One of my uh, causes of recent decades has been to get what I regard as equal protection for retributive justice. Of the different kinds of justice, I think retributive justice until the last 30 years was pretty much discriminated against. I noticed in Ted Hondrick's book on punishment in the 60s, for example, he joined the chorus of people thinking retributivism was pretty much on the way out. Um, it turns, turns out it's not in the academy, but I think it is in um, popular views, which is why it's a good thing to talk about. Well, let me ask you just one clarifying question before we get to some other views, and that is um, when you say just desserts, how do you know what's just? Well, that's the question of people like Beck Rhea put several centuries ago. Do you know the hearts of men? The answer is, of course we do. I mean, even Justice Holmes said, you know the difference. Even a dog knows the difference between ki being kicked and being stumbled over. We know what kinds of conditions you need to hold people responsible, and we make responsibility judgments all the time. You break my uh, Ming vase in my house, if you stumble, that's one thing, and if you smash it with a baseball bat, that's quite another. Okay. There's lots more to talk about there, and we'll come back to that, but let's get some other views on the table before we do that. Ted Hondrick, um, tell me a non-retributivist position. Well, let me just say a quick word about what we've heard from Michael Moore. He says that a penalty is right because it's deserved. A penalty is right because it's deserved. And I want to ask him, what is it for a penalty to be deserved? And the things he said rather suggested that a deserved penalty was a right penalty. But then the retributive theory, to the effect that a penalty is right when it's deserved becomes the boring truism that a penalty is right when it's right. Well, we all knew that. I think there's a lot wrong with retribution theories, and that's just a start on it. What is correct about punishment is that it must be justified, if it's justified, by its having good effects. That commonsensical view that things are made right by what they give rise to applies to punishment like everything else. 
And so it's the case that punishment, if it's justified, must be justified by its consequences. Some utilitarians thought that, and uh, they have indeed been mentioned. And then you get the view that the justified punishment or the right punishment is the one that produces the greatest total of satisfaction or happiness. There are a lot of problems about that because the best total of satisfaction or happiness can be something that involves some people being very happy indeed. So my own view of punishment, which is one that justifies it by its effects, says differently that a justified punishment is one that is in accordance with what you can call the principle of humanity. And it's a principle which has to do with getting people out of bad lives and into good lives. And in a brisk sentence, punishment is right when it serves that end, when it gets people out of bad lives into good lives. It happens to be the case that most American punishment doesn't do that. And given this consideration, most American punishment, like most British punishment, is in fact morally unjustified. It is indeed true, as Gretchen said earlier, that there must be some obvious necessity in punishing for rape, but that leaves an awful lot of other punishment. Most of our punishments, by my view, are morally unjustified. All right, so we've got a view that says punishment uh, is right and is uh, justified when it's deserved. Another view that says it's justified by its effects, in particular its effects in getting people out of bad lives and into good lives. Steve Garvey, let me ask you to give us another view, if you would. Okay. Uh, my own thinking about uh, punishment tends to uh, emerge from a sense of dissatisfaction with what I take to be the prevailing statements of the utilitarian way of thinking about it and the retributive way of thinking about it. Uh, this account of punishment I call punishment as atonement. Uh, and it begins from, it's an ideal theory of punishment in, the sen in this sense. It asks, well, what would uh, punishment look like uh, in a genuine community, uh, in a community where people treated each other with equal concern and respect? You can think about this um, as uh, how does punishment function in a more intimate social group, like a family, um, something, a social group that's um, not the uh, anonymous uh, social group of the state. And the, uh, the this understanding of punishment as atonement uh, begins with a distinction between um, harms and wrongs. Uh, it's an effort to try to understand exactly what it is uh, about a crime uh, that makes it unique and distinctive, uh, unique and distinctive from, say, in, in what lawyers would call a tort. So a crime um, uh, is a wrong in the sense that it's not simply causing material harm to another person, it's causing a moral injury to another person. And what does that moral injury consist in? I think that that moral injury, at least in the paradigmatic cases of criminal offenses, consists in the wrongdoer sending a message. Uh, this is an expressive account of what crime consists in. And the message is, I am better than you, I am superior than you, uh, I don't have to follow the rules that you follow. It is a signal or a message, an expression of contempt for the victim. Now, another way in which this, um, okay, so that's the distinction between harms and wrongs and crimes or wrongs. Uh, another way in which this theory is, an ideal theory is it takes, it, it imagines an offender who um, experiences remorse and repentance um, for what he or she has done. In this sense, it's an ideal offender, right? This is the, the appropriate response to one's uh, transgression. And what the offender wants to do uh, is to regain his or her standing in the community as a member in good standing. And the process, I imagine a process that a person has to go through in order to regain uh, this, this good standing. And the process has two basic steps. The first is expiation. They, the offender needs to do something to expiate, if you will, the guilt that attaches to them as a result of their wrongdoing. And the second step uh, is re reconciliation. This is uh, a reconciliation between the offender and between uh, uh, the victim so that they are at one atonement once again. Okay, so just a few more minutes, uh, a few more seconds on this. Expiation <laughs> has three, has this, the process of expiation, the offender has to apologize, okay, um, to disown the wrong uh, that he or she has done, has to make reparations, uh, has to uh, make amends for the material harm uh, that he or she has caused, and also has to undergo punishment or submit to a penance 
And the reason you submit to a penance is to symbolically lower or humble yourself. You take back, you annul the message that was implicit um, in your, your crime that you were superior. And then that completes the process of expiation. At that point, the wrongdoers expiated their guilt. They have done all they can to regain admission. And then the burden shifts to the offender, or sorry, to the victim, um, to forgive. Uh, and once there's forgiveness, once there's the overcoming of the resentment that the victim rightfully experienced, felt, uh, at being wronged, there's reconciliation. All right, that's a pretty complicated system, and we'll talk about lots of it and more. Let me remind folks that they're listening to Odyssey from Chicago Public Radio. I'd like to pick up on one thing that Steve Garvey said um, before we go forward, and that is the notion of what a crime is. Steve Garvey, you laid out the idea that crime is a, a, a moral injury of a certain type, an expression of contempt for the victim, and that understanding quite clearly seemed to shape what ought to follow in terms of punishment. I'd like to know how it works in the other systems. Michael Moore, how are we to understand what a crime is on a retributivist view? Well, I wouldn't over-intellectualize it the way I think the moral rehabilitationists, of which Steve is one, do. Uh, what's wrong with killing people is you kill them, you know, you end your life. It's not that you express a message of superiority, although perhaps wrongdoers feel that perhaps they don't, and perhaps you can imply it even if they don't. Um, crime is the violation, at least what we in lawyers call malum in se crimes, as opposed to more technical crimes that may be needed to be on the books to solve coordination problems and the like. Malum in se crimes are typically rather gross violations of the rights of victims, like a right, like a right of bodily integrity involved in both rape and murder. Um, what's wrong with those crimes is they, basic, they violate the basic rights of the victims. Okay, Ted Hondrick? Well, uh, the question of what a crime is can be looked at in various ways, as we've already heard, but um, I would like to suggest uh, one way of looking at it. Uh, a crime is something that offends against uh, a certain social system. A crime is something that goes against a distribution, say, of wealth and income, amongst other things. Now, in the United States, the top one-tenth of population, that is the best-off tenth of population, has 71% of the wealth. And the bottom four-tenths, that is 40% of Americans, have 0.2% of the wealth, that is a fifth of 1%. And with respect to income or consumption, the top tenth of Americans, they have 30.5% of that roughly a third so and the worst off one tenth and, and the worst off one on, and, the, on. and the worst and the worst off one tenth as 1.8 percent now that is a social system that is morally vicious that extent of inequality and the distress that attaches to it is morally vicious and crimes are among other things offenses against the rules that produce that morally vicious society so income inequality is a crime no, I don't say that. Okay. I say I say that if people lack uh, the things that make life decent, and they lack them because of this particular distribution of wealth and income, then crimes are things that are against a system of rules and a kind of society which itself has no moral justification. I don't mean okay. to pick on America in particular. Much the same is true of Britain. Today on the program, we are exploring different philosophies of punishment what makes a punishment right or correct or just. We're joined by Steve Garvey, who's on the faculty of Cornell Law School. He writes on the philosophy of criminal law and the death penalty, and he's joining us from Ithaca, New York. From Bristol, England, we're joined by Ted Hondrick, who is the author, most recently, of After the Terror. Ted Hondrick is a philosopher emeritus at University College London. And joining us by phone from Urbana, Illinois, is Michael Moore. Michael Moore is a legal scholar at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and the author of Placing Blame, A General Theory of the Criminal Law. All right, let's, what I'd like to do is throw some different topics around punishment on the table, and uh, you all kind of wrestle them out and see what differences among your positions emerge thereby. I'd like to start with an issue that um, surprisingly didn't really get much attention when we were talking about the basics of each of your views, and that is the question of deterrence. A lot of people think that one of the main reasons that you punish crime is to deter people from committing crimes. Um, and yet we didn't hear a lot about deterrence in the first part of our show, so let's talk a bit about that. Steve Garvey, tell me what you think deterrence has to do with the way you understand punishment. Um, 
I would understand punishment again in this ideal fashion as a as a penance, a penance that the it's a penance because the wrongdoer uh, willingly accepts uh, the punishment. The the penance would be proportional to the culpability with which the wrong was done uh, and the harm uh, that was caused or the harm that was risked. But deterrence would be a byproduct. Um, it wouldn't be the the, the focus both in terms of deterring the specific offender and also more generally keeping people from other people from committing crimes is just a byproduct yeah you don't impose the punishment you don't set the punishment um, at a level that achieves the kind of deterrence that you want to achieve you set the punishment uh, as a proportion of the as I said the culpability and the wrong that was done now that there's a I suppose you could say a specific deterrence component uh, to what I've said insofar as um, if you have an offender who, unlike my ideal offender, who's already repentant and wants to undergo penance, um, who needs to be brought to that point, um, you know, in that sense, you're trying to bring a person from a, a, a position of defiance, if you will. They don't, they don't realize that the appropriate response to their wrongdoing is to accept uh, their punishment. All right, Michael Moore, what do you think about deterrence? Uh, I think it's irrelevant to punishment. It's it's, I think, underrepresented amongst the three of us, perhaps, although maybe um, Ted will save the day for you. But I think in terms of it being uh, relevant to deterrence, uh, deterrence relevant to retribution, it's not at all. It's not for the reasons that um, Ted Hondrick briefly referenced. It's, it can't be a sufficient reason to punish because you can deter people by punishing innocent others, and that would be, by everyone's admission, an unjust practice. It's not a necessary condition of punishment. Um, people like Eichmann, for example, may have deserved severe punishment, even though there's no deterrence for war criminals because they typically think they're going to win the war. It's not even a relevant factor for degrees of punishment because the moment you start adding punishment beyond which is deserved for deterrent reasons, you are using that person for social ends, i.e. treating him as a means to what is admittedly a good end, namely crime prevention. If you want to prevent crime, as opposed to the backdoor remedy of deterrence by punishment, you ought to do the kind of thing um, Ted Hondrick, I'm sure, would be sympathetic with, namely, get rid of the causes of crime, foremost of which is poverty. Ted Hondrick, what are your thoughts on deterrence? Um, could I talk about uh, prevention rather than just deterrence? Yeah. There, there are a lot of very enlightened people who think that punishment doesn't deter and doesn't prevent offenses. And many of them say things like this, well, if punishment really were preventive, um, it would um, make people frightened of committing crimes in the future, or it would make them reason that committing crimes was a bad bet and they ought not to go into it. And the general idea is that punishment doesn't deter or doesn't prevent, because there are lots of offenses which are done by people who are out of reach of fear and are out of reach of rational considerations. But there's another whole side to prevention. Um, I've never committed any serious offense, and it's never come into my mind, and a lot of people are like that. We're habitual, so to speak, law abiders. And I think the existence of this large amount of people is importantly owed to the immense institution of punishment in our societies. It's a little crazy, I think, to think that the institution of punishment, judges, jails, the whole lot, has no significant social effect. I think the main effect it has is on people like me who are not instinctual law abiders but we've been formed into law abiders by the institution of punishment so okay that's an observation about punishment I mean about d the deterrent effect of punishment do you think that's a legitimate goal of punishment well you can deter in different directions you can prevent in different directions after all there have been systems of punishment which were aimed at the most horrific things, it deterred people, for example, from respecting their parents. I mean, the Nazis, after all, had a system of punishment and crime which required people to rat on their parents if their parents were hiding a Jew or something like that. It's perfectly obvious that systems of punishment can be preventive or can be deterrent in various different directions, some good, some horrific, some better than others. And as I've suggested already, I would like a system of punishment which has a good aim, that is the aim of the principle of humanity mentioned to you before. And so, so you can't judge, you can't analyze the deterrent effect of punishment separate from the overall goals of the system of punishment? Well, you can, I mean, the question you raised initially, I think, was does punishment deter? Does punishment have a preventive effect? Now, there are a lot of enlightened and liberal-minded people who think it doesn't, but I think it does. 
and I think the fact that I don't offend is that I, um, my attitudes have been formed in a society which has a dominant institution, which is punishment. I think I might go in for offences, except for this large fact of punishment in the background in my society and in the formation of my attitudes. Okay, but actually my question was whether deterrence is a legitimate goal of punishment. Goal. Right. Um, Bertrand Russell once ran into somebody who said to him, you think um, the ends justify the means? And Bertie replied quite reasonably, whatever else could, my good fellow, whatever else could. <laughs> of course, of course I think that the ends of the system of punishment are what justify it. And that's because I don't think anything else could. It's not really true that people, for example, who attempt to justify punishment by retribution, and perhaps Michael Moore will correct me here, it's not really true that people who ordinarily justify punishment by talk of retribution aren't thinking of effects. In Britain now, the retribution theory appears in our popular press. If it's asked, why is that man being punished? It's replied openly, it's to give satisfaction to the victims. That is what the retribution comes to. One gets, gives satisfaction to the victims of offenses and others. But that, of course, is to justify punishment precisely by its effects, precisely by the effects of giving satisfaction. No one could think, I hope, that a man should be put in jail for 40 years in order to give good feelings to people, but that is what the retribution theory comes to. Michael and it Moore? is a consequentialist theory. Michael Moore? I think Ted's having a tournament with a straw man, and I don't, I'm not surprised he just unhorsed him. I don't think retributivism can be defined uh, or reduced to the corner of defending victim satisfaction. There are theories that are mixed retributive satisfaction theories, like Jeff Murphy's at Arizona State that say something like this. The state has a full permission, right, to punish just because the person deserves it. But that doesn't give them a reason to punish, and the reason can be supplied by victim satisfaction. That's the kind of theory, perhaps, that Ted is thinking about, but we retributivists got together about ten years ago and told Jeff he had to turn in his car because that wasn't a retributive theory. Retributivists are the people who think that you do not justify it by its effects, you don't justify any theory of justice by its effects, and there's a basic difference in viewing morality at issue here. Because it's not just the criminal law, but it's also distributive justice, what it is you owe to those less advantaged than yourselves, and it's corrective justice, both in its promissory and non-promissory forms. All of those are, are on justice theories, not justified by their effects, and certainly not by victim satisfaction. If that were the choice, I certainly wouldn't be a retributivist. Okay, let me introduce another question into our discussion, and that is the issue no, of the no, death... Hang on a second there. Couldn't we just have a moment to reflect on what we've been told by Professor Moore? <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, he, he's very vigorous in saying that the retribution theory isn't, isn't the theory to the effect that punishment is justified because it gives satisfaction. And um, I was driven to having that view because I couldn't make sense of it in any other way. Now, he thinks he can make sense of it in some other way. He's not a man who says punishment is right because it's deserved and then analyzes deserved into right. That is, he is a man, apparently, who can save the retribution theory from circularity, and he's not going to reduce it to this vulgar stuff about victim satisfaction. But it's not very clear what he does say. He may be a unique retributivist, and maybe I should have read Placing Blame, a general theory of the criminal law, but I didn't get a chance. I suspect that what he thinks is something like this. Punishment is justified when it's according to a fair system or something of that sort. Uh -oh. But, of course, uh, if you're justifying punishment by saying it's fair, once again, you're in a situation of circularity. Of course, punishment is right if it's fair, but we'd like to know what makes it fair. And if you're justifying it by saying it's a system and you treat everybody in this way, well, that's not a red-hot consideration. Suppose um, I'm now doing a rape. Suppose I'm doing a real rape and someone comes along and says, uh, look, you've got to stop that. And I say, well, look, I'm doing this systematically. This is a particular situation, and this woman is a blonde, and I'm very consistent. I'm perfectly consistent. I rape all blondes in this situation. Nothing unfair about this particular one. I'm operating according to a system. Well, I hope, Gretchen, you would take the view that the man who was doing that rape didn't get very far forward in justifying it by saying that he was systematic. Michael Moore? I feel like I'm watching an old remake of Ivanhoe where another straw man got unhorsed. Um, I don't, of course, want to reduce dessert to fairness either. 
There's an old criticism that I think Ted introduced that's worth discussing. It's this notion of whether you have to unpack dessert in some way where it does some real justificatory work. Unlike what he thinks, I think, here's what I think. I think dessert is simply another way of stating the conclusion. It doesn't give the reason why we should believe retributivism to be true. It is one way of stating the conclusion. It's like stating the following claim, both with and without dessert. It is intrinsically right that we do not punish those who are not morally culpable. Another way to put that is you shouldn't punish people if they don't deserve it. Now, dessert in either case, either the sentences I just used it in, or in the case of retribution, don't do any justificatory work. They are a way of putting the conclusion. The claim of the retributivist is that you should have a society that punishes, not just those who deserve it, you can put it the other different way, punishes those who culpably do a moral wrong. And indeed, the criminal law, when you look at its general structure, fills that out in great detail. It's people who do voluntary acts that cause bad states of affairs, what are those rights violations, without justification or excuse when possessed of sufficient faculties to be a rational agent and have a culpable state of mind. That's what being a morally blameworthy actor is. You don't have to use the word dessert at all. So that's just a red herring about the emptiness of dessert. I think, though, there is a real issue. It's the issue about justifying legal institutions by their effects. If that's required, then retributivism is unjustified, as is the claim of justice that you shouldn't punish innocent people, as is a claim of distributive justice that we should redistribute resources to those least advantaged. None of those make any sense, I think, to one of Ted Hendrick's um, justificatory positions. Okay, let me stop here because I have a little bit of business to do. I need to remind people that we are going to take some calls later in the show, and I need to give the number in order to do that. one 859 1800 If you'd like to join in our conversation with a question or a comment, go ahead and give us a call. Ted Hondrick, I'm sure you want to respond, but Steve Garvey, we haven't heard from you in a little while, and I'd like to know if you have a thought on this question of whether there's a problem of circularity in a retributive argument, because you're relying to some extent on a retributivist position. Yeah, my own take on it is that, um, that retribution is sort of a second best, that if you can't get an offender to um, to repent uh, and to accept their uh, punishment as a penance, then you um, you impose punishment uh, in a retributive sense. But for me, I guess I'd want to say that the, there would be a reason that you impose punishment. And the reason you impose punishment is to uh, vindicate the value of the victim, to express solidarity with the victim, uh, and that these can be done only through punishment. I, well, let me sort of say well, how I think my own take on it uh, differs from retribution and utilitarianism and from something called restorative justice. Um, I do think that uh, there is a goal uh, to be served by what I would prefer to call penance. Uh, and that, again, is the reconciliation, is part of the process of reconciling the offender and the victim. Um, so it does have a goal, uh, independent of simply doing justice, which makes it, I take it, non-retributive. Uh, it's not simply utilitarianism because although it has a goal, like utilitarianism has a goal, um, it treats punishment or penance as an integral part, as a necessary way to achieve that goal. Punishment is not something that's contingently justified. And it's not something called restorative justice, which is another um, uh, philosophy, I guess, um, that's not represented here today, but which is uh, quite uh, popular in some circles. Um, restorative justice, like atonement, uh, emphasizes reintegration and reconciliation as goals, but as I read it, but not as all of its proponents understand it, but as I read the literature on restorative justice, it hopes to get there uh, without punishment, and I think that punishment is a necessary part of, uh, of achieving the kind of uh, reintegration, reconciliation, atonement. Uh, that restorative justice folks want to achieve. You're listening to Odyssey from Chicago Public Radio. We're talking today on the program about philosophies of punishment. Our number is 1-888-859-1800. We've got a whole lot on the table today. Ted Hondrick, let me come back to you. Um, I suspect you're not satisfied yet. You're right about that, sweetheart. <laughs> you're really right about that. Somebody w walks into you know your studio or this studio and says, "Is punishment right?" 
and uh, three people give a reply, and one says, yes, punishment is right if it's restorative. And um, that, of course, um, is a view we have heard from Professor Garvey. And somebody else, this is me, says, punishment is right if it has certain good effects. And then somebody else appears, and uh, he says, punishment is right if it's deserved. And uh, the first man who said punishment is right if it's restorative thought he was giving a reason when he talked about the restoration, and I certainly thought I was giving a reason when I talked about the good effects. But now Professor Moore appears amongst us, and he says punishment is right if it's deserved, but he thinks that um, there's no justificatory work in his verb, no justificatory work done by his mention of desert. Well, that's very puzzling to me because I thought he was giving a justifying reason for punishment when he said it was deserved, but now it turns out that's just a fancy way of saying what? I don't know that it's intrinsically good, intrinsically good that the vicious should suffer or something like that. And of course it is a version of the retribution theory, but it has an amazing shortcoming. Anybody can announce an intrinsic good. Here are two for you. One intrinsic good is that you should um, forgive people their offenses. Here's another intrinsic good, that you ought to line up Latvians in straight lines at noon on Wednesdays in Michigan or something like that. Anybody can announce an intrinsic good. doesn't do any good because the other side can announce the opposite one. If the retribution theory really reduced to that, it would reduce to less than nothing. Ted Hunter, hold on because we have to take a break. Uh, Michael Moore, give us a hint as to where we should look for the justifying work in your theory. Well, I want to look for where Ted finds his intrinsic goods on redistribution. We both have the same problem in ultimately giving reasons not based in terms of good consequences but rather why we believe it to be true. It's intrinsically good to either redistribute to the poor or punish the guilty. I'm not sure that I understand that, but we have to take a break anyway. So we're going to do that and come back and try to get a better handle on things with some phone calls. Stay with us as we continue our conversation about philosophies of punishment. I'm Gretchen Helfrich, and you're listening to Odyssey from Chicago Public Radio. Welcome back to Odyssey from Chicago Public Radio. I'm Gretchen Helfrich. Our topic today is philosophies of punishment, different views by which we understand why we should punish people. We're talking with Steve Garvey, a legal scholar from Cornell Law School. He is in Ithaca, New York. In Bristol, England, we're joined by Ted Hondrick, who is philosopher emeritus at University College London. And joining us by phone from Urbana, Illinois, is legal philosopher Michael Moore. We're going to take some calls in a moment. Our number is 1-888-859-1800. But before we do that, Michael Moore, I did not understand what you said just before the break, so I'm going to ask you again. Where do you look for the, the justifying work of saying that a punishment is deserved? Okay, what I had said just before the break was a form of uh, broaden the discomfort strategy. Everyone that you're talking to has to justify there being an intrinsic good state of affairs with which they then justify other things as instrumentally good. That's true of Professor Garvey, true of Professor Hondrick with their own notions of intrinsic good. It is, of course, true you can announce anything, including Latvians in Michigan being in a straight line, being intrinsically good. Some, I think, are more plausible um, than others. That's not high on the list. If one wants to give reasons for why something is intrinsically good, like that the guilty be punished, that the innocent not be punished, or that the poor be redistributed opportunities, then one has to give a reason not in terms of the effects of those practices, but rather in terms of some other reason that you can think of that induces belief. Now, the kinds of arguments that I and other retributivists have made are of two forms. One is indeed to seek some yet more general principle that does not reduce to giving good consequences of punishment, but simply shows more generally why it's fair in some way or something else. That's one strategy. Another is to ask what's called a coherence question. Are there a mass of particular judgments of which the retributist principle is the best expression? And those kinds of judgments are both third-person judgments, what the late Gene Hampton used to call judgments of moral hatred. If you truly care about victims and the morality that protects them, 
you do not simply have an attitude of don't cry over spilt milk when such victims get culpably injured by somebody else. Or if you should be someone who injures others, you get drunk, kill a child, your appropriate response, one would hope, is that you feel extremely guilty. Again, no, no sort of attitude of just don't cry over spilt milk, from which the inference can be drawn. Maybe you feel guilty because you are guilty. And what guilt means is that one should suffer. Now, those aren't consequences. This is not Steve Garvey's theory of inducing guilt by punishment. That may or may not work. It is rather using your third-person experience of hating moral violations in others and the first-person experience of hating them in yourself as a basis for believing that those feelings respond to a general principle you think to be true. Okay. Ted Hendrick, I'm, I know you have something to say about that, but we've got to take some phone calls, so I'm going to oh. go to the phones. Our number one eight 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 five nine. One eight zero zero. Let's take a call from George. Hello, George. You're on Odyssey. Hello. I uh, hear a lot of theories about crime being proportionate uh, to the punishment that people hurt and so forth. So I was wondering how your uh, panelists would uh, handle the question of marijuana. The uh, there are great numbers of people in this country who have been enduring, who have committed what many people would call victimless crime, having long punishments for this. And I was wondering who got hurt, who gets the benefit, where's the retribution, where's the fairness on these marijuana uh, so-called crimes? And I'll hang up to take the answer. All right. Um, anyone want to argue for long sentences for marijuana crimes? Steve Garvey, would you like to? Nope. <laughs> uh, it, you know, at this point, I think the, the 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 issue raised by the question is, well, what kinds of things, what kinds of acts should be made crimes? Um, and at this point, I would defer to Michael Moore, who, who has a, a, a great uh, theory about what sorts of uh, things should be crime, that only moral wrongs should be crimes. And I'll leave it to him to develop whether or not marijuana possession is a moral wrong. No, I didn't pay him for this, but I'll take the <laughs> hand off anyway. Um, I think it's outrageous that we have the drug laws that we do. Um, I have a paper called Drugs and Liberty, which basically argues we should repeal all of them. They don't harm others. They're not a violation of rights. They're not moral wrongs. And on a proper theory of the criminal law, you wouldn't punish them. Um, they're not even instrumentally wrong, that is, they're not wrong in a way in which you might think possession of burglary tools is wrong. Um, not that it's itself a bad thing, it just it tends to be good evidence of there being something bad about to happen. Um, so I think that's a good instance where there is no retribution to be achieved, and I think that of many things on the books, certainly including most sexual offenses. Ted Hondrick? Um I really shouldn't say anything about this, but I do have one slightly primitive instinct. It's always said that smoking marijuana doesn't, uh, so to speak, increase the probability of getting on to hard drugs and all that. I think that's a little unlikely myself. I suspect that uh, soft drugs make some contribution to getting on to hard drugs. We've just had an absolutely horrific pair of killings in Britain which had to do with drug gangs, two um, young women were killed, and I, I'm willing to contemplate the idea. I know this goes against a, a lot of uh, estimable liberalism, but I'm willing to contemplate the idea that that these are not exactly victimless crimes because they make some contribution to subsequent offenses which have very clear and very sad victims. So they may be more complicated crimes you're suggesting than than some of some other readings might suggest. Well, I would I would like to join um, Michael Moore and others in in a very enlightened view, but it's not clear to me that it's true. Another enlightened view remarked on a little bit earlier in the program is that deterrence doesn't work, but deterrence I think does work to some extent. I think a certain cynicism about the great and the good and their hopes for us is in place. Okay, let's uh, take another call. Let's talk with uh, Barry. Hello, Barry. You're on Odyssey. Hi. Uh, my question is, what does your what do your uh, guests think about the idea of sending people who uh, threaten the lives of other people uh, with uh, violence or or take their lives, sending them to an island where they're free to 
you know, live among them, themselves and battle those who are equal to them in promoting uh, violent crimes. Steve Garvey? Uh, I don't think that's a good idea. Um, uh, prison uh, is itself kind of an island, uh, but on my view, um, the state owes an obligation, has an obligation even to offenders um, to reintegrate them back into society. Now, there's a question which I haven't put a lot of thought into is, are there certain crimes, um, certain heinous crimes, awful crimes, that place uh, certain people beyond the pale? Um, so that they can never, they lose their ticket, uh, they can never gain uh, readmission, they should never be readmitted back into the community. I don't know whether such crimes exist, um, but I, I, and so I'm sort of uncomfortable um, dealing with the sort of the, the borderland, uh, the, the extreme kinds of cases. Uh, I think my theory, my understanding of uh, punishment as atonement works best, you know, when, when, when not at the extreme. Ted Hunter, couldn't one make a consequentialist argument um, about public safety? With respect to With respect what? to violent criminals, with, with some, some scheme in which violent criminals are, are basically kept away from everybody else. I'm, I'm, not, um, I'm not of the view that one ought not to, so to speak, take care of violent criminals. There's nothing namby-pamby about me mm -hmm. in that respect. But there are a lot of crimes which are different in character. And um, they are crimes which issue an awful lot of punishment. And I have a very different view about those from my view about the crimes, uh, rape and violent attack and things of that sort. All right. Let's take another call. Let's talk with Brad. Hello, Brad. Uh, yeah. You're on I was very interested in the atonement idea. Um, mm -hmm. Is atonement even possible in the current legal system that we have? where records are kept forever, and once you're committed a criminal act, it'll be on the Internet forever. Uh, I'm yeah, interested no, in what the good... panel has to say about whether or not uh, any government's going to be able to achieve atonement as the uh, payoff of the completion of a penalty. Uh -huh. Steve Garvey? Um, you know, my first uh, take on answering the question is, you know, I, I need to put more thought into how you would translate uh, some of these grand ideas into a practical operating uh, criminal justice system, but it does seem to me. Well, couldn't you just thing... have an ideal criminal justice system? <laughs> yeah, you can have an ideal. That's the, that's the easiest kind to have. A smaller uh, criminal justice system. <laughs> exactly. Um, but it does seem to me that some of the uh, disabilities that are, that are imposed upon uh, uh, offenders who have served their time, done their penance, um, need at some point to be lifted. There needs to be some uh, recognition on the part of the state uh, that. Um, the, the debt has been paid. Oh, okay. Sorry, I thought you were about to say something more. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> you are listening could to I, Odyssey I, from Chicago Public Radio. Ted Hondrick, go ahead. Could I ask a, a question of Professor Garvey? Um, I haven't got a full hold on his view of punishment, but I recognize the sort of thing it is. And he keeps saying things like this um, about the offender and the person undergoing punishment or about to be punished that uh, he wants to atone or he agrees to his punishment or he's such that mm. uh, he would like to get back into good standing or something like that mm. that is he, he he thinks he has a view which is related to the view that uh, in the better part of themselves punish uh, vic offenders agree to their punishment Hegel had that view mm. and a lot of other people have had it and it's not surprising that he calls his view an ideal view of punishment, uh, because he seems to have in view ideal people. But uh, your usual bunch who turn up before the courts, um, they don't actually want to atone, and they don't agree to be punished, and what they want to do is avoid it. And to pretend that, uh, so to speak, their real personalities don't matter all that much, and it's their higher or ideal personalities that are seeking all this atonement and stuff like that, seems a little unkind to them doesn't seem, so to speak, the most humane and gentle of views. This rather high-minded view seems to have a rather tough side to it. If a man says to me, the last thing I want to do is go to jail for 40 years, for me to say to him, well, your higher side uh, calls out for atonement, I think that might be thought to be a little rough and tough. 
Steve Garvey, we just got a couple of minutes left, so let me uh, ask yeah, you to kind of my, wrap my up. My response with that. to that would be, you know, it's it, the the view is, of, of course, most offenders are not your ideal offenders, uh, but the view is that we should try to respond to those offenders in such a way as as to bring them around, to to enable them to recognize that what they have done is wrong, to experience the guilt that Michael Moore and I think they should experience, and therefore to believe because uh, feeling guilty is believing you should submit yourself to punishment. You don't coerce them. Uh, to come to that point, um, but um, this is where the, this is the relationship between retribution and atonement. Atonement is an ideal, right? Um, we want to respond to offenders in such a way as to bring them around, to get them to repent. But if they don't, they're still punished. Uh, but retribution, punishing them to vindicate the value of the victim, so on and so forth, uh, is the second best. Vindicate the value of the victim. Mm -hmm. There's such a lot of stuff like that, which none of your listeners is absolutely clear. We don't really know what you're talking about when you talk about vindicating the value of the victim. These theories, that theory, and the retribution theory, there's a lot of talk there, but people are a little uncertain what it comes to. I think punishment is justified by effects, and people can understand me when I say that, and they'll understand, too, the kind of effects I specify. It seems to me that a clear-headed theory of punishment is going to have a little trouble with your view. It, I respect it and uh, respect you, and I can respect Professor Moore as well. But the retribution theory and the restorative theory, it's a little airy fairy, isn't it? Steve well, Garvey, you know, last word. My response would be um, you know, th the alternative is worse. Uh, utilitarianism, the long standing objection to it has been. But I'm not one of them. I'm not a utilitarian. The consequences well, yeah. you because you head. like the principle of humanity. Well, I'm not quite certain I know exactly what that means either. All right, we're going to have to wrap it up there. Steve Garvey's on the faculty of Cornell Law School. He's written extensively on the philosophy of criminal law and the death penalty. He joined us today from Ithaca, New York. We were joined from Bristol, England by Ted Hondrick, who is the author most recently of After the Terror. Ted Hondrick is philosopher emeritus at University College London. And from Urbana, Illinois, we were joined by Michael Moore, who is a legal scholar at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and the author of Placing Blame, a General Theory of the Criminal Law. Michael Moore, Ted Hondrick, and Steve Garvey, thank you all very much for a very invigorating conversation today. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thank also, you both. thanks also to everyone for listening and for calling. Odyssey's theme music was composed and performed by OK Go. Thanks to our research assistant, James Lyris, and our intern, Paul Vanelli. Our technical producer is Steve Waranowskis. Our program is produced by Allison Cuddy and Delia Lloyd. The senior producer of Odyssey is Joshua Andrews. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you could do a couple of things. You could visit our website, www.odysseyradio.org. And you can get information about the show. You can listen to past programs. You can also send us email at letters at odysseyradio.org. We're happy to hear from you. When you're at the site, you can even sign up to get a daily email update about what's coming up on the show. You could also write us a regular letter, 848 East Grand Avenue, Chicago, Illinois, 60611. That's our address. Odyssey is a production of Chicago Public Radio under General Manager Tori Malatia. I'm Gretchen Helfrich. Join us again next time for Odyssey. Odyssey is marketed and distributed by Marge Ostrushko. Funding for the program is provided by generous grants from Doris Sasser, the Staines family, and the listeners of WBEZ Chicago, where Odyssey is produced. The views expressed are not necessarily those of Chicago Public Radio, this station, or its sponsors. To listen again, visit our website, odysseyradio.org. You can find information there on how to order a copy of the show. That's odysseyradio.org. Thank you.